All right. Well, I don't know what uh, happened. I just found out a few minutes ago that my PowerPoint slides that I attempted to uh, share through Dropbox, uh, which I dropped into Dropbox yesterday, I thought, around 11 or 12 a.m., um, somehow did not get uh, to us, uh, get to the team this morning that puts that into uh, the video. So uh, you will not have PowerPoint slides this morning, I understand. And so, well, we'll go ahead and make do without that. And um, hopefully uh, I'll be able to uh, say things in a way that helps uh, make up for that. All right, well, we're in a section of Romans, um, Romans chapter 13, continuing some of the material in chapter 12. Uh, that is entitled The Christian and the State, verses 1 through 7. Okay, this is a section on uh, the Christian and the Christian family. All right, well, the Christian and the Christian state, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. We're going to begin in verse 1. And the point on the slide that would have been there proper attitude, submission to authority. Now, this is in a section on God and the Christian family. And uh, in particular, as we looked at in a previous week, how Christians should behave. And so I'm thankful to the Lord that he gave us uh, the word of God, aren't you? I'm thankful that the word of God is given to us as a guidebook of life, uh, telling us both what to believe and uh, how to behave. And so we have this continued uh, guidance this morning, and we're in chapter 13, 1 through 7, this in particular, the first seven verses of this chapter, is our relationship to government. And how appropriate is that? Because we have been interacting with government a lot this year. I think a lot of us are tired of interacting with government, uh, as in having to follow coronavirus, COVID-19 regulations. Uh, but now we have a section of the Word of God uh, that reminds us of some things that should be our attitudes, uh, should be what we're doing. Well, let's begin in verse 1. Again, this first point on the slide, our, a proper attitude is submission to authority. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for as there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Now, the word soul in this passage is just talking about a person, okay? So let every person be subject unto the higher powers. Subject, that is, uh, in submission to, okay? And so the word powers here, um, one uh, commentator mentions uh, elsewhere that Paul uses this term uh, to reference angelic powers, uh, even sometimes fallen angels. Uh, but that is not the thought here in this one. He's, he goes on to say, in the present context, the powers appear to be human rulers. And so even though there are powers of darkness, even though there are angelic powers that would be of light, uh, that's not what the reference here is referring. We're talking about those that are in leadership position that are human leaders. Okay? And so let every soul be subject or in submission to the higher powers. Now we come to a, uh, a core truth here uh, in the second part of this verse that tells us why that should be that way. For there is no power but of God. Amazingly enough, when we uh, think about all the rulers of the world, where do they get their power from? It's delegated by God. Um, you might say that Paul places this whole question on a very high plane. God himself is the fount of all authority. And so when you look at our rulers, they cannot do anything but that they're allowed. Do you remember the words of Jesus to Pilate when he's on trial? Pilate says to Jesus that basically he has power over Jesus. Don't you realize I could put you to death or I could free you? And Jesus says, you don't have any power, but it's given to you by God. I'm, of course, paraphrasing that passage. Um, but Pilate did not have any power except that God allowed him to have power. If we have an understanding of God's sovereignty... We understand that that's the case. Now, we'll, we'll come back and tackle a question, um, maybe sometimes a little bit of a disturbing question. What about those rulers that are very wicked? What about a Mussolini or a Stalin or a Hitler, the three leaders of countries there in World War II that were just horrendous? 
and uh, and you know well we'll get into that later what about those kind of leaders well um, there aren't exceptions here and uh, this study this morning is is too short uh, too narrow for us to get into some really detailed thoughts on God's sovereignty but uh, we do learn in Christ in, in the scriptures and just to summarize it God works through evil people and evil circumstances to accomplish his good will as well as working through the good and so again our study this morning can't get into uh, super great detail on the sovereignty of God but just because there are evil rulers does not dismiss um, or cause to be untrue the fact that political leaders get their uh, powers from God they are delegated by God and so therefore in this passage the the thought that Paul is addressing here is this to disobey the political leaders or other leadership by the way this this is broader than just political leadership so I think this uh, also is uh, could be applied to leadership within the body of Christ um, leadership within the church pastoral leadership uh, for example okay? and so this is what commentator says to disobey them is to disobey God human government is a divine ordinance and the powers of coercion and condemnation which it exercises have been entrusted to it by God for the repression of crime and the encouragement of righteousness okay so again let's read that verse there there is no power but of God the powers that be are ordained of God now it goes on in verse 2 to give us some more information about these thoughts verse 2 whoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or like a condemnation or uh, God um, bringing down his uh, verdict of guilty and uh, any punishment that comes with that. Um, whoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. So I'd say for us uh, this morning, a, a core underlying um, principle for us to live by is this, that we understand that, uh, that authorities that are out there have been delegated that by God and that we're careful not to challenge that because we're really challenging God. Now, uh, one example of another uh, situation of authority uh, that I don't think it's the, the immediate thought here, uh, but it's a true thought uh, nonetheless, and that is parental authority. Uh, so for young people out there, children, uh, the Bible says in Ephesians, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Uh, parents have been given their authority delegated by God. Uh, they do not derive their authority from themselves or from the fact that they're bigger and older, um, or even getting their authority from the state, which is in part true, that uh, laws in our state, uh, the, as in, the, it could be the state of California, but also our, our national government, uh, laws support parental rights in um, having authority within the home, uh, at least to a certain extent. Um, so um, here, when we resist authority, we're really resisting God that uh, will receive a punishment for that. Okay, verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Okay, well, the idea of good works here is the idea of good conduct or good behavior in this. Uh, one author says that few sayings in the New Testament have suffered as much misuse as this one. Uh, he thinks especially of its misuse in justifying uncritical submission to the dictates of totalitarian governments. So we're going to come back uh, to this thought. Um, do we have to just submit to any kind of government no matter what they are, are doing? Let's come back to that phrase, good works, here, uh, that rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. That's verse 3. Well, uh, generally speaking, with uh, governments, that's generally the case, and that, in fact, is a major purpose of what government's about. Um, our laws in our country are there 
to curb evil and to, uh, in, in many cases, to promote good. And so honesty, for example, is encouraged through law. Stealing from people is discouraged and stealing is punished, uh, but uh, we're encouraged not to steal and, and to be honest. And that's an example of how rulers are not a terror to good works. If you're an honest person and you do what's right, you're, you're not generally walking around uh, in terror of what the government's going to do to you because you did something that was a good thing to do. Generally speaking, the governments are going to punish those who are doing things that are wrong. And in the majority of governments of the world, it's the laws uh, that the government has passed, whatever form that might be in, whether it's passed by a legislature or whether you've got some sort of king or monarch who's just decreed a law. It's when you disobey those laws that you've got to worry about it. And so the purpose of government, though, is to promote uh, good and to uh, try to curb and disturb, uh, uh, I don't even know what word I was searching for there, uh, discourage, to discourage evil. All right, uh, the, verse 3 then, wilt thou then be afraid of the power? They do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And so generally speaking, we don't have to fear uh, those in authority because the reason they're there is to promote good. And so if we're doing what's right, we don't have to fear that. Okay. Well, back to this uh, question, though, of what about rulers that are doing evil? Well, that uh, same commentator is reading earlier says this, the obedience which the Christian man owes to the state is never absolute, but at the most partial and contingent. It follows that the Christian lives always in a tension between two competing claims, that, that in certain circumstances, disobedience to the command of the state may not only uh, be a right, but also a duty. This has been classical Christian doctrine or teaching uh, ever since the apostles declared that they ought to obey God rather than men. Uh, this is the, the key verse for us, which I imagine many are already familiar with. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Uh, I would encourage all of us, if we haven't committed that to memory, Acts 5, 29. Commit that to memory. Make that a memory verse. Um, it's a, a very great verse of guidance so that when a circumstance has come up, you have that pop in your mind. Okay. Well, in Acts chapter 5, you have Peter and the other apostles coming into conflict with the leadership uh, in, their, in the city they were in. And the leadership in that city was asking them to stop teaching about Jesus, stop preaching in the name of Jesus, and they would not do that. Um, they had been instructed that, they disobeyed uh, that um, once uh, after being instructed. And in verse 28... The authorities come to them and say, did not we command you that you should not teach in this name, speaking of Jesus? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, these particular leaders were Jewish. And so they, they also don't like that they're being blamed for the death of Jesus and uh, being held accountable for that. And here's what Peter and the other apostles say in verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. And so this is the, the number one clear principle in any kind of civil disobedience on the part of a Christian is this idea that when we have two authorities, that's really what it is, you've got God and you've got men, the men who are delegated their authority by God, whether they recognize that or not, whether they admit to that or not, God's that higher authority. And when we're looking at two authorities here, and one is saying, do this, and the other saying, do that, and they're in conflict, we're forced into a choice. And Peter and the other apostles said, we ought to obey God, that higher authority, we ought to obey him rather than men. Now, it's not a heart's desire uh, to, uh, to have a rebellious spirit against human authority. But if human authority is going to ask us to obey God, we just have that kind of obvious choice. 
In fact, I almost think that most Christians um, would probably have come to that same conclusion that uh, Peter and the apostles did. But I'm, I'm so glad it's recorded in scripture for us. That when I have a choice of God or men who to disobey, I pick the higher authority. And so sometimes we're forced into that. Uh, but we got to be careful. Um, we got to be careful as Americans. Uh, we do have a tradition in our country as Americans of, of independent thought, uh, more so than as I understand in Europe. Uh, many of the people that came to our country from Europe were coming for opportunities that did not exist as they were coming out of the, the feudal system in Europe. And uh, much of the land ha was owned and controlled by the, the wealthy landlords. And the average person didn't have a lot of opportunities there. They came to this new land where there was lots of opportunities to, you know, have your own farm, you know, live your own life and, and not be uh, stuck into a system that didn't give you those freedoms. And I think uh, in the history of our country then, there's this thinking of independence. And I think sometimes that can carry into our mindset I don't want to be told what to do. Okay? Um, in the history of our revolution in our country, uh, we wanted to um, be treated a certain way by the king. And so, again, we had a revolution of throwing off the rule of the king and instituting self-government. Again, the thought is, I don't want to be told what to do. It's kind of a, you know, well, it's kind of a natural human thing, uh, but I think it's also a... Uh, even more so an American thing. Uh, maybe it's ex um, accentuated or accelerated a little bit more. And so if we're not careful, we can take that attitude. I don't want to be told what to do. We can do that in our personal lives with God. I don't want to be told what to do, God. You want me to do this. You want me to do that. But I don't want to do that. And so we have a, um, a natural inclination to uh, be rebellious. And it's, again, it's a human nature thing. So all people groups of the world have that tendency. But no exception in America, but we can take that and, and we can apply that to our political leaders. I don't want them telling me what to do and uh, have a natural tendency to maybe want to rebel against that. I don't want to listen to them or I don't agree with them or they're not the party I voted for. I don't want to listen to that. And so uh, we have to be careful here because the clear teaching again is that that authority is delegated by God. And I think that the clear exception uh, to ob obeying and following that is when they're asking us to disobey God. Okay, so there is that clear exception, but outside of that situation, maybe we uh, are kind of on shaky ground, so we better really think through the particular issue because I realize that there's all kinds of ways that this could be applied. I mean, all, all kinds of things rulers could be asking us to do, and, and maybe at times it's not always so clear-cut. Uh, so we ought to, do, though, really think that through and be careful to be guided by Scripture uh, in this. Um, by the way, uh, another thing about us as Americans uh, that's a good, a good thing is that we recognize that in our government um, we have a supreme authority. And the supreme authority is, is not the local mayor, uh, it's not the governor, it's not the president. Uh, we understand in our country that the supreme authority is the laws of the land, specifically the Constitution and the laws. That we are, you might say, we are a nation of laws. And we also have freedom within our country uh, to debate these issues within that framework. So there's a lot of freedoms, actually, as Americans we have uh, legally to challenge authority when they're asking us to do something. And within our country, that freedom is there um, and not, it's not considered uh, to be a disobedient way to challenge that. So writing your congressman, uh, protesting something that they're doing, um, Voting, uh, these are ways of expressing those views, challenging something in a court. But at some point, though, we may be asked to follow something we don't want to do. And uh, we really have to ask ourselves at that point if God is asking us to do something different. And I know, like with the case of... Uh, um, some of the regulations related to coronavirus, we've had that issue come up. And um, I think part of the considerations that churches have had in that is we are commanded by God to offer him worship and we're commanded by God to gather together as a local body of believers 
uh, we're also given in our country's consti uh, our constitution, we're given the freedom of religious uh, worship and expression. And so at times uh, governments have, uh, the governments in our country, a lot of times state governments, uh, have overstepped that bounds and Christians have protested that and challenged it in court and sometimes have won and sometimes have not won. Um, but uh, again, an example though of that. Now, uh, would Christians ever defy uh, that order? Well, it depends again on what the government's asking us to do, but uh, that would be a very real and possible thing. All right, so again, that's uh, the first three verses of chapter 13, and all of that falls under the title, Prop, uh, Our Proper Attitude is Submission to Authority. Now let's go on to a point number two. Government is instituted, well, I've actually kind of got ahead a little bit on this one. Um, uh, I mentioned this already prematurely, I suppose. Uh, government is instituted by God for our good. And uh, this goes in, is gone into more detail in verse 4. It says, for he, speaking of the, the, human, uh, um, the human leadership or authority, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And so again, we, I won't go into that point again, as I've mentioned, that God has instituted these uh, institutions and these people for good. Uh, but I will add to that um, this next thought, and uh, this would be um, a motivation for our submission. Okay, so I'd add this as a third point, a motivation, and there's a twofold motivation that is here mentioned in this. Fear of punishment. Okay? If, thou, if you do what's evil, be afraid. Fear of punishment. Now, I don't think that's our primary motivation because our primary motivation is submission to God. God, if you instituted government, then I respect you. Because of my respect and submission to you, I'll respect and submit to what you've created. So respect and submission to God is the primary motive. But the secondary motive is the government can get you. Uh, and, and we know about that. I, uh, anyone like paying their taxes? Income taxes? Income tax form? Do you enjoy that? Okay, you're strange if you said yes to that. Um, we don't want to pay taxes. Uh, but we recognize, um, as Christians, we recognize it's the right thing to do. But beyond that, we know if you don't, the government doesn't just sit around and say, oh, you didn't feel like doing that? Well, okay, I guess we'll let you out. Uh, no, the government's going to come after you. Uh, they're going to, you know, they don't have a problem taking your home away from you for lack of paying taxes or, or uh, uh, taking other property away. And so be afraid of what they can do to you. Uh, but here we have a reference, he beareth not the sword in vain. Uh, well, the sword is represent, representative of punishment, but that also is hinting at the ultimate punishment, capital punishment, uh, taking one's life, executing a criminal, um, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. And so this is part of that delegated authority. Now you read about this back in the book of Genesis. Um, Genesis says when a man sheds another person, person's blood, in other words, a man commits murder, okay, by man shall his blood be shed. Capital punishment uh, is talked about in the scriptures. Now, uh, some might have a little bit of a, of a conflict of uh, uh, like, a, you know, really a kind of torturing themselves in their minds what to do on this. What if you're a Christian and you're in governmental leadership? Uh, you, you have the um, instructions by our Lord Jesus of things like turn the other cheek, okay? Um, not casting the first stone. And how do you reconcile these with instructions to government to execute wrath on those that do evil? And so uh, we would hope and trust and, and pray that Christian leaders have some wisdom on how to apply scripture. It's really hard to give a blanket statement to all of that because, again, it depends on the cir circumstances and situations. Uh, but the fact is, I think a Christian leader may be called upon to execute wrath on someone in their government leadership position. Okay? Uh, but the Bible says in general for us, uh, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And so in, in general for Christians, executing wrath and revenge and 
vengeance is not our position or, or in general what we're to be doing, but that may not always be true. You might have a Christian that's in the position of, you know, maybe a prosecuting attorney or a judge in a court um, making these kind of decisions. And in that case, again, we, we pray and hope that they are using the scriptures for guidance as to the level of wrath to execute and what to do. Um, but again, that's instituted by God. Okay, so fear of punishment by governmental authorities. And then um, I've mentioned the other uh, major motivation, reverence for God. But that uh, reverence is uh, discussed uh, in more detail in verse 5. Wherefore, you must needs be subject or in submission, not only for wrath, that first motivation, but also for conscience sake. It's the right thing to do. And uh, so we need to have that thought in our mind. Okay, and then our next point, uh, looking at um, our next uh, couple verses, uh, submission to authority would include paying uh, taxes. Um, verse 6, for this cause, because of these reasons that we're to submit to authority, pay ye tribute also. Okay, pay your taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Of course, this was a touchy point amongst the Jews at the time. Uh, remember that passage where they tried to trip up Jesus in his words by uh, saying to Jesus, uh, should we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Tribute was that form of taxes. Uh, Caesar was the Roman leader. He was the king of Rome. Uh, they used the word Caesar instead of king. Uh, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Many of the Jews did not like this, so they were trying to really divide the Jews up on Jesus. The, the, the majority, or not majority, but a lot of people were following Jesus, and the Jewish leadership wanted to disrupt this and, and wanted to undermine Jesus' ministry. So they thought, let's get him on this, because either way he goes, he gets into trouble. If he says, pay your taxes, then the Jews will, many of the Jews will get mad at him. And if he says, don't pay your taxes, he's going to get in trouble with the Roman authorities. And so they thought they had this catch-22, this no-win situation uh, in this. And uh, you, you may recall what Jesus said. Uh, pay, uh, he said, uh, pay or render uh, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And it was an answer that no one could really uh, you know, nail him for. Uh, but it's, it's similar to Acts 5.29 that we already quoted. We ought to obey God rather than men. Yeah, so you, you've got governmental authority. I mean, if they're in conflict, you've got to obey God rather than men. But it's not a denial of submission to human authority. It's just when they're in conflict. Well, render to this authority the things that you should render to them and render to God the things that you should render to God. That was Jesus' answer. And because this is instituted by God, delegated authority, tribute or taxes is part of that. And so because of this, uh, the verse 6 says, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing, or they're on these things that we've been talking about, um, especially when we go back to that uh, verse 4, Min he's a minister of God to thee for good. And uh, the fact is that those types of things uh, take money. Uh, government, you know, police officers, things like that, um, public officials, they, uh, if that's what we're having them do, like you have a police officer, he still has a family to feed, he still needs a place to live, you got to pay that. Um, if we're going to have, you know, police officers, firefighters, I mean, these are all part of the civic authority. Um, they're, uh, those kind of institutions are uh, founded because local leadership has instituted those. They, they're making decisions on building a police precinct or a fire station, and, and the, the, that stuff costs money. And, and so then the, that political leadership, you know, city council, uh, board of supervisors, is passing ordinances of taxation, maybe the state government. Sometimes in our system, they put it to the vote of the people, which also the passing of, a, of something like a tax by the people carries the same weight of law. And so we have to have that submission there. Okay. Um, so let's see. Now, one uh, commentator mentions on that phrase, pay ye tribute also. He says in the uh, authorized version, that's the King James Version, says, as in the Greek, 
This may be understood either as a statement or a command. And this uh, particular uh, commentator thinks it was, it's probably more of a statement. Okay, so he, he kind of summarizes this way. Um, this is your justification for paying taxes to pagan rulers. Okay. And so uh, this meaning their delegation from God, as, as we looked at, the fact that they could execute wrath, uh, the fact that our reverence and, and submission to God is in play because of these things, paying your taxes, you got justification for doing this as a Christian, even if, if you think that the government is using some of that in a way you wish they wouldn't, or even if you disagree, you've got this justification for doing it. That's the way this uh, one commentator puts it, because they are God's servants. Okay. Now, whether by the way, that's whether they recognize it or not, that, that's irrelevant. They are God's servants. Uh, they might not um, admit to that, the Bible tells us uh, in the future, every knee shall bow. Someday we all stand before God. Every knee shall bow. Uh, we don't decide whether God's our uh, authority or not. Government may say God's not our authority. They might declare God to be non-existent, or they might recognize God's existence. Um, it's all irrelevant because they are God's servants, whether they admit to it or understand that or not. Verse 7, uh, kind of a concluding verse of this first section, Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And we kind of hear in that kind of a wrapping up of several of those thoughts. Tribute and custom, so paying taxes, Fear to whom fear, you know, fearing what government can do if we break the law. And so, um, render in this, render therefore, kind of does echo, doesn't it? Uh, the words of Jesus when he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God's the things that are God. Uh, that's uh, Mark twelve seventeen, by the way, where I've been quoting Jesus on that, on his uh, answer to the, the leaders who are trying to trip him up. Okay. All right, well, let's go to a new section here. Okay, so that first section there uh, was a section on our relationship with governmental authority. Um, I have entitled it The Christian and the State. Well, what about this next section? Now, remember this so we don't lose, tr uh, we don't lose sight of the overall picture of where we're at. This is about how Christians should behave. And those first seven verses of chapter 13, how should we behave in relation to authority? governmental authority it could be applied to parental authority authority within the church but the most immediate um, uh, thought there was governmental authority okay so that was how do we behave ourselves in relation to authority this next section is going to broaden this out because that that's really in our relationship with to some people um, you might say um, some of our neighbors and i'm using that word in the biblical sense but there are other neighbors around us who are not authority. And so now let's broaden this out. How should we behave with them? Okay, I've entitled this section, Love Your Neighbor as Yourself, which obviously I put it in quotes. If we could see the slide, you'd see that title of the slide in quotes. Because it's obviously a quote of scripture if you're familiar with that passage. Okay, Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, verse 8, let's read that. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Well, this is the law that, that is being hinted at in the title he gave, Love Your Neighbor as Yourself. Um, we're told that there are the two greatest commandments in the Bible, love God and love others. So these are the greatest commandments. And we'll come back to that verse that's uh, uh, in one of the Gospels that I have later in the in my notes here, uh, but we'll come back to that. But uh, the verse says, on these two commandments hinge or hang all the law and the prophets, that everything we're to do in scripture comes back to these two commandments, love God and love other people. And so we see a hint to this um, beginning here, um, but uh, where it says to love one another. Uh, but this is going to be the rest of this chapter. So we're going to look at verses 8 through 14 now. Okay. But notice this, it says, owe no man anything. That's kind of interesting. Uh, don't owe, uh, owe someone anything. 
Now, what is meant by that? Well, the general admonition of Scripture is, uh, to the extent possible, uh, be, be careful about debt. Now, does the Bible say that debt is always wrong? I do not believe so. But the Bible does warn about debt. Uh, here's some examples. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Um, we know what would happen if we stopped paying our mortgage. We know what would happen if we stopped making that car payment. Uh, we know that the lender has power over us to take those things away from us. And so there is a power there. Now, I'm kind of glad we don't live in a society where people get thrown in jail for debt. Uh, that used to be that way, debtor's prison, uh, where people would go to jail. Uh, we don't have that in American society. But still, there's a ruling over us in other ways when you're in debt to someone else. Okay? Uh, the word another in this but it says uh, contrast, but to love one another, and that's literally uh, one's neighbor there. It literally is the other. So owe no man anything but to love the other, the other people around us. Okay? And so um, let me read a summary of this before I uh, look into this interpretation a little bit uh, more. Um, here's a summary of this. Acquit yourselves of all obligations except love which is a debt that must remain ever due. Okay, so I'm going to unfold that more, but I just thought I'd read a summary of that right now. So we have two things going on, regular debt and the debt of love. Okay, well, here's uh, what one uh, person says. The interpretation of this command is to be taken with this limitation, that we are not to be indebted to him so, f so as to injure him or to work ill to him. And I have some verses to support that, so let me back that up. Verse 8 says this, Owe no man anything but to love one another. And so that the loving one another is the big guiding principle, by the way, uh, here. But um, we know that you can injure someone by loaning them money. And there are many people out there who would gladly do that. In fact, this has been a big problem with the human race. And that is using someone else for my own benefits at their injury. You know, I like win-win situations, but there's many people who are perfectly fine with a win-lose situation. Uh, that's the history of slavery in our world. Uh, that's the, the history of the mistreatment of, of other people in many cases. Here's some biblical principles that guide this. Let's tie this idea of loving other people to uh, debts and loaning money. Exodus chapter 22, verse 25 to 27, instruction in the Old Testament law about loaning money to your neighbor. It says, if thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee or next to you. Okay, guys, um, the, the scriptures, I do not believe, prohibit ever loaning money to people. That is why in this passage, amongst many others, it says, if you do that. Now, there's lots of cautions against it, but it says there, if you lend money to any of your people that is poor beside you. Uh, so if you're going to loan money and it's to a person who's poor, and oftentimes that can be the case, people that have no money at all that are poor are ones that are, are going to potentially be tempted to borrow money because they don't have many options there. They don't have resources there uh, to fall back on. It says, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer or as someone who is charging interest. Neither shalt thou lay upon him interest charges. Usury is the word used here in the King James. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that the sun go down. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass wherein he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious." Well, here's what the picture is. This is a poor man, and many of the poor in, in that time period, uh, when they went to bed at night, what did they have for a blanket? They had their coat. And it says, you're not going to go to that person and say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to loan you money, but I need some sort of collateral for that. I need some, something that you give me for that. Oh, okay, you don't have much to give me. Give me your coat, 
as kind of I hold as collateral uh, for the money so that we can get that back. And, and God said, if you do that, you're not going to keep that 24 hours. Uh, you, maybe you do that for a couple hours, but you're going to give that back to him, whether he pays back the loan or not, you're going to give that back to him so he has a blanket for the night, because, so he has a covering for him when he goes to sleep. In other words, <clears throat> we're not going to exploit another person for our own benefit in a way that is in injury or injurious to him. We're not going to put him in a position where he's crying out to God in in prayer uh, because of the pain that we've inflicted on that person and the, the hardships that we've put them in. Okay, In other words, we're going to love our neighbor. We're not going to use them as an opportunity for our own advancement at their expense. Now, can we ever loan someone to them and charge them interest? I think we can when we're in a situation where it's not going to harm them. Okay, when they have the ability to pay back that loan and they're, they're working and able to pay that back without being destitute, without going hungry, without having you know, no blanket at night. Okay, so we have to have that kind of love for other people. Uh, here's another example, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 6. No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge. Now again, a, a pledge is collateral. It's something you take in exchange for the money. You basically say, I'm holding on to this until you pay this back. Once you pay it back, you can have it back again. It's kind of the, the backup of the loan. It says here, you're not going to take the nether or the upper millstone for that pledge. You're not going to do that. Why? For he taketh a man's life to pledge. What was that upper or nether millstone? This, <clears throat> this was a small millstone uh, for making daily bread. So here you have a poor person and this is their this is their tool for grinding uh, wheat or whatever, grinding it into flour so they could actually have bread to eat for the day. You're not going to take away the tool that allows this man to feed himself as something that's a backup for the loan. Uh, again, you can see in this, you're not going to hurt the other person you know, um, in these uh, types of situations. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 10 to 13, when thou lend thy brother anything, Thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring out the pledge. So in other words, you're going to give him some respect, and you're going to treat him with some dignity, and you're not going to just go charging into his house to take back uh, something. Uh, you're going to stand outside and let him bring it out uh, to you. It says that, um, in any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless you. And it shall be righteousness unto you before the Lord your God. A similar thing, you know, holding a pledge of something like his cloak, his outer garment. Okay? And so, in the case of a poor man, um, who, as one commentator sa says, who had pledged his cloak, it was to be restored before night as the poor in eastern countries have commonly no other covering for wrapping themselves. Um, but here it says in the end that they may bless you. God will bless you when you treat other people well, when you don't hurt them in the process of getting something for yourself. And so we're uh, told back here, in, back in verse 8, owe no man anything but to love one another. And the major focus is that. Now we want to be careful about debt, but let's focus on uh, the loving one another side of uh, things. Okay, this is a debt. In fact, by the way, this this section uh, kind of you know transitions uh, from our first section. There, you have things you owe government, but now let's talk about other debts that you have. Well, be careful about getting into debt, but we have a debt of love here, and. The section uh, of the verse says, but to love one another, uh, love is a debt which can never be discharged. You can never pay it off. Here's a debt you have. You need to love people. Pay it off and pay it off. And you know what? As you love other people, you never get out of that debt. You're always in debt on this one. And so let's be in debt to other people uh, to show love to other people for the for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And so, in order to illustrate this point, 
the Apostle Paul in the next verse runs over the laws of the Ten Commandments. Now, he runs over all the ones that are in relation to other people. Um, the first uh, four commandments of the Ten Commandments that are in Exodus chapter 20 uh, listed there um, are really about our relationship to God, but the Apostle Paul lists out the other ones that are in relation to man. And let's read verse 9. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, steal, bear false witness, covet. Okay? Well, these are our relationships to other people. Uh, we're not going to steal from them. You're not going to commit adultery. Have a relationship with someone that you don't have a right to, violating their relationship with others, like uh, someone who's a married person, violating, really injuring their spouse. By having a relationship with them, injuring their spouse. Coveting what they have wanting what they have, stealing what they have. It's our relationship to people. If you love another person, you don't have an adulterous affair with their spouse. If you love another person, you don't steal from them. If you love another person, you don't look at something they have and say, I wish it wasn't theirs, I wish it was mine. You would rather rejoice with them. I'm so glad they have that. Look at the car they have. That's a beautiful car. I'm so happy for them. You might say, I wouldn't mind if the Lord blessed me with a car like that. But I don't wish their car was mine because I'm happy for them. Uh, because I have a love in my heart for them and I'm glad for their good fortune. Okay? That God has blessed them. And the end of uh, the verse there, verse 9, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is that overarching uh, law for us. Verse 10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And so we are to love our neighbor. And I haven't mentioned, uh, I've been going through the points of the slide, but I forgot to mention them specifically. We're actually now on a third point of the slide. Have the mindset of alert expectancy. So we're going to wrap this up quickly because I'm out of time. But Romans 13, beginning in verse 11. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Okay, so... It is high time to awake out of sleep. We need to be alert and be aware that God could return at any time. And we need to have this, this attitude of wakeful expectancy of the Lord's return. Uh, Jesus said, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is come or is at hand. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh. Lest coming, suddenly he find you sleeping. He said, that was uh, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing, being watchful, looking for the coming of the Lord. And so in this verse, uh, we have here that our salvation is nearer than we, when we believed. Um, the idea of nearer is in the sense of the full results of salvation, one commentator lists a number of ways that this could be interpreted. For sake of time, I'll just read the one that he believes is true. And also, I think, makes the most sense to me, which is why I'm sharing it with you. He says, it probably, however, has its usual meaning here, denoting that deliverance from sin and danger which awaits Christians in heaven and is thus equivalent to the expression, you are advancing nearer to heaven, you are hastening to the world of glory, Daily, especially this last part, daily we are approaching the kingdom of light and in prospect of that state of existence we ought to lay aside every sin and live more and more in preparation for the world of light and glory. Okay? In other words, um, if we're living according to these things, um, we're watching and waiting, we're progressing as Christians growing and more and more uh, towards that final state, in which we'll fully experience all that salvation has to offer. Therefore, we are nearer to that and growing nearer to that uh, than when we first believed as Christians. And so, all right. Well, the last verse is there. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let's put on the armor of light. Let's live the way we should. The last point, put on and put off. And let's walk honestly. Let's put off rioting, verse 13, drunkenness, uh, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Put on the Lord Jesus. Make not provision for the flesh, 
flesh to fulfill the lust. In other words, this passage has been how Christians should behave. Let's put on Christian behavior. Let's put off non-Christian behavior. That's how the chapter wraps up. All right, well, I need to go ahead and end there. And look forward to seeing many of you at the morning worship service in just a little bit. Let's close our time in prayer. Dear God, we ask your blessing now on the morning worship service. And we uh, pray for uh, the safety of those who will be traveling here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.